you're more re religiously inclined than you think. Something. Somewhere. So how much does being a Jehovah's Witness actually help you? Oh, a great deal. It was an effort first off, Morrissey. It was a good four years effort, but now it's, it's, it comes easy. I enjoy it. You know I like people, many other actually. people who are Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, yeah. There certainly is. It's three and a half million of us. I have always admired Viv Nicholson because of her background and the way she, she fought against her background of, of uh, total poverty and pr practical destitution. I was happy in the haze of a drunken hour But heaven knows I'm miserable now Her whole story of winning the polls and uh, her husband's dying and her, the disasters that followed and the way the newspaper tabloids haunted her and tried to drag her, her down and um, decry her as an individual. But constantly through the face of this disaster she had a, a remarkable resilience and fortitude and humour and a great sense of living which I think is quite rare. I've come, when the money's gone down, I've come down, you know. You can only be there if you've got it, so you come down in stages and that's how I got down to where I am. It's the rock bottom now. But I'm enjoying it. I just feel trapped, you know. And it's nice to say, would you like to come to London to sit with Morrissey in a car, you know. Sure. Yeah. It gets me out. <laughs> in my life, oh, why do I get valuable time? I like the fact that when punk came along, that it did demystify the whole process of making records, that people realised that if they knocked over a few phone boxes and sold somebody's motorbike, they could raise enough money to put out a single. But in those days, uh, a lot of bands, were having done that, then broke up because they were perfectly happy to do that. They'd achieved something that they'd wanted to achieve. They didn't see it as part of a kind of lifelong career process. When punk began, I was 16, 17. It meant a great deal to me because within the Manchester area it was very, very exciting and it was very big and it was very important and there were a lot of key voices within the punk movement who came from Manchester so therefore special attention was paid to the area and it was very thriving, very busy. Here were people practically in one's own backyard who were suddenly known throughout the country because there you could see possibilities for yourself, if you like. Personally, I thought all those groups were crap. Um, because it was at a time when I was getting into crafting songs and writing chord changes and moving things towards middle eights and all those technical um, building of songs kind of techniques. And none of the, those groups could do that. I mean, I understand now that it was probably a good thing for music, but at the time it meant nothing to me. The girl groups and Full Spectre was a big influence, a Redbird record label. That was really my main inspiration in trying to play the music that we ended up playing, um, get away from particularly duo, synthesizer duo kind of music. Um, drum machine orientated disco music was very, quite a big thing even then. And um, I was delving into um, the Red Bird collection. A lot of Libra and Stoller stuff mainly, they, they were and probably still are my favorite writers. Uh, there was one, one day Joe Moss gave me a, a video which was really important to us now of um, a Libra and Stoller interview. It was, as I said, we were a really big influence. And uh, where one of them, I can't remember which, said he just got to the point where he knew who the other guy was and they hadn't met. And he thought, well, if we're ever going to get together, I'll uh, just go over there and knock on his door and so, say, you know, let's get together and write songs. We sounded very, very idealistic, but it caught my imagination, probably because I was, uh, and I'm an idealistic kind of guy. And uh, so that's what I did. I think Johnny was the, the, the instigator, really. You know, he just went around and knocked on Morris's door, basically. Then um, he got Mike in, then he found me up. 
worked right from the word off without getting too sooty about it was that I saw a lot of good things obviously in him that I didn't see myself and vice versa and he was he, just, he didn't say much and he just let me tell him what I wanted to do and um, just sat and kind of watch me and checked out my shoes and checked out my hair and all those things and uh, <clears throat> I was taking quite a chance because I was very very fashion conscious and had a very strong image and I wasn't quite sure about what he was going to look like or what he was into at all and walked in his house and he was really taken aback when hello and so on and uh, so he invited me in first thing I saw was this huge cardboard James Dean crucifix thing so I thought well that's not too bad I'm, I'm on a winner here and um, I, it brought me into his room and there were all, all these great pictures of um, with James Dean and a couple of Elvis pictures and stuff and immediately there were, it became obvious that we had a hell of a lot in common as regards um, our feelings towards pop culture and, and um, records generally. He gave me a whole s series of uh, songs, batch batches of words, and just to see them on paper, I've never, literally never seen anything like it. Even as a fan of serious, quote, serious writers, you know, the Dylans and so on. Because um, the first thing I saw was um, Suffer Little Children. I did have a fixation on the Moors murders that I was perhaps a potential victim, if you like, a little bit younger than the victims. It was a very strong subject in Manchester throughout the 1960s, very, very strong, very almost unspoken thing. It was too horrific for people to, to, to think about and to discuss. I was taken aback completely because it was, the content was so, so serious, but at the same time, very, very poignant and poetic. I just looked at them and straight away I worked out the kind of the music that these images evoked. But this is no easy ride for a child cries. Oh, find me, find me nothing more. We are on a southern misty morn. We may be dead and we may be gone. Our immediate goal was um, for a single, for there to be a single with a great song on the A side. Uh, whether it had our names on the label as the group was secondary. It was our names being in the brackets, which was much more important. Very into the, the songwriting ethic. In spite of strong interest from major record companies, the Smiths signed with the independent label, Rough Trade. Morrissey was able to have complete control over their record sleeves, which featured a series of cover stars, rather than the group itself.
Many people had expected the group to sign with the Manchester label Factory, which had embodied the city's musical image since the late 70s.